My talk this afternoon is you've never had it so good, and sorry the topic's a little bit vague, and sorry I can't actually see any of you out there at all. Um, I left it vague because I like to surprise people, and I left the biography a little bit vague for that reason as well. So just to explain a little bit, the topic is about frustration. Frustration at three different levels. Firstly, frustration at being an old guy in a young person's industry. I mean, I still wear cardigans, for heaven's sake. Frustration at how difficult it was for me to break into that industry 20 years ago. And with all the advantages people have 20 years later that they're generally wasted. People have these supercomputers in their hands the whole time and they use them to send Snapchat messages to their mum when there's no toilet paper left. <laughs> if that didn't dumb down things uh, enough, I just wanted to start off on a, a strange tangent that I like to relate things to football a little bit. It makes me easier to explain things. And I thought it would be nice if I could try and explain my career against that of a famous footballer. So... I started with this guy, Ryan Giggs. Um, no laughing at the back. Um, Giggs, I'm sure everybody knows who that is. He played for Manchester United for 20 years, um, played in some fantastic teams. He's now in management. So I thought that's a decent simile to the, the career I've had in, in digital. But, of course, I am certainly not Ryan Giggs, am I? So and I, his brand's got a little bit toxic in the last few years, so I don't really know if I want to associate myself with that. So I went back to the drawing board and came up with that guy. Anybody know who that is? Apart from you? It's Gary Caldwell. He's playing for Scotland at the time. Uh, Gary played for some big teams, um, but he didn't really stand out in any of them. He's moved into management, and people are actually quite happy about that. Um, he's got a very big head, and he scores a lot of own goals. So I thought, perfect, that's my man. So if you want an introduction to me, that's, that's who you're up against this afternoon. But where did it all start? So... That is me, more specifically, that is me. Um, <laughs> that's my primary school class just over 30 years ago in Perth. We're being taught to sew cross-stitch by a particularly formidable teacher from a previous generation. My hand is up to ask the question, why are we spending time learning this boring repetitive stitching mechanism when a computer could do it for us? Because I was going that way at the time. History doesn't record the torrent of abuse that came back my way, but it was something along the lines of, David, you haven't learned the more advanced way to do something yet. You're learning the very basics. There's always a better way, a faster way, and you'll end up doing it a bit more productively. You would never teach the computer until you knew the more productive, advanced way of doing it, rather than the simple way you're doing it today. And um, if Miss Campbell's out there somewhere, you were right, but I wasn't listening. At the time, I used to develop games for the ZX Spectrum. I don't know how many of you had one of these things. I didn't have a rubber one because I couldn't stand how grotty the keys got. Um, that's a 48K machine. I built a football game to, to live inside that computer. Um, the game was rubbish, and I learned quickly that I'd run out of memory to make it any better. 48K wasn't much to play with back then. Rather than follow the advice of my teacher and try and figure out a better way to do it, I waited, left the game on the shelf until the Space Age 128K computer came out two or three years later. Sadly, the same thing happened. I built the game and repeated some of the same mistakes and no longer um, made it any better. It actually got worse and I'd filled the memory again. So I, I went to the resident geek at the school because every school had one. I said to Barry, Barry, look at my code and tell me what's wrong. Barry laughed at me, and if it was a more modern age, he probably would have sent me a Snapchat message, something along the lines of that one. Um, he said to me, David, if only you'd learned the more advanced way to program, you wouldn't have copied and pasted the same basic boring function 130 times through the code and filled up the memory with it. And um, going back to the sewing teacher, it's a lesson I clearly hadn't learned, and that kind of filled in my career from then on. Back in those days, though, to try and follow Barry's advice, the only way you could do these things was to learn it from magazines and books. And 20, 30 years ago, um, magazines used to print pages upon pages of code that you would spend hours and hours typing and then realise it didn't work. You'd spend hours going back through the code, hunting for the semicolon that they hadn't printed. <laughs> or even worse, hunting through the pages to find what you thought was a semicolon was some ink that ran on the page. The worst part was these books that you generally got from the library because there weren't many of them and they were too expensive. 
Um, the books were absolutely disgusting. Programmers have never changed their habits down the ages. Anybody I work with will tell you that the standard uniform for a web developer is yesterday's T-shirt and last night's dinner. <laughs> These books are very much the same. They were absolutely minging. And nowadays, if, um, if a good piece of programming is, is created, it goes viral in 10 minutes on the internet. The only thing that went viral from these things were germs. <laughs> and it's no wonder the school used to laminate them for that reason. So being too difficult to make yourself any better, I abandoned any idea of being a programmer or an astronaut. And um, I eventually decided to pursue the wild world of accountancy. And um, <laughs> two years into that, I was given the chance to develop a piece of software for the local council to run some school finances, which eventually uh, lasted 10 years in production. And I'm quite proud of that and thought, because they gave me the time to, to work at this, there may be something in this after all. So I went back to the drawing board and things hadn't really changed. Books were still the way to go. Amazon pretty much made them cleaner and cheaper. Um, but the thing that, that dawned on me at the time was the internet was there. The internet let you access um, documentation, advice, um, code 24 hours a day. And instead of spending £300 a month on books, I could spend £300 a month on a phone bill instead. Why would I let my wife phone her family and friends when I could spend the night arguing with somebody in Russia about the semicolon that he'd missed from his, his advice the day before? Um, but back in those days, I still had friends that were at university. And of course, they didn't need to spend £300 a month on a phone bill. They had it free. The students could access 24-hour learning, documentation, advice, same as I could. But they didn't use the time for that. They spent their time playing Doom. They spent their time downloading pirate software that they didn't actually need. Or they spent their time looking at pictures of um, dubious women. <laughs> the thing was, everybody back then had a website. I don't know if anybody used GeoCities a few years ago, but GeoCities was the first real free place to create a website for yourself. Um, GeoCities would give you some kilobytes, maybe a megabyte if you were lucky, with an address, and you could make a terrible website like some of the ones you see on the slide there. I ran a website with a pub guide for the city of Perth, and it was quite advanced for its time. We had star ratings, we had reviews that we attracted from the public before crowdsourcing was even a thing. Um, but again, going back to the lesson of school days, the sites were very basic because GeoCities only let you do certain things with them. If you wanted to do something a bit more advanced, you had to learn databases, you had to learn scripting, you had to learn some design, you had to learn various things that became the, the job title known as webmaster, which is a dying art these days. And um, back in those days, um, it, it's, it's the thing you couldn't learn, sorry, I've jumped a slide, the thing you couldn't learn was how people interacted with this stuff, how they were going to get to it, how, they, how to attract new users, how to get them back more often, because these things weren't written. 20 years ago, this stuff was so new, you had to figure it out for yourself. Maybe I should have written some books on that at the time. But things that are second nature today were a blank page 20 years ago. And it's that sort of blank page that's become intuition now that I want to try and explore for a little bit longer. Um, I sent my first email 30 years ago. It took equipment Frankenstein would have been scared of, it um, cost about £20, and it took an hour to send five lines to some schools around the country with a weather forecast, of all things. That's my son, Andrew. He sent his first email aged four. He didn't actually mean to, and it took some explaining at work the next day, but he did it anyway, and he did it by intuition. He'd seen other people using a phone and managed to send a mail without really trying. Um, and that's the kind of intuition that's suddenly become prevalent, just as an aside, with the, mes the message he sent, you could have fitted my entire 128K Spectrum game and still had uh, enough space for a photo of your dinner, which he sent five minutes later as well. <laughs> Andrew doesn't play with Lego anymore, but he still builds things with blocks. He does it inside Minecraft. I don't know how many people here have been cursed by Minecraft in their domestic lives. Um, in my day, if you wanted to do something different with Lego, you waited for your birthday, you waited for Christmas, you saved up pocket money, um, or you destroyed the thing you built yesterday. In Andrew's life, he spins up a new world, or he comes to me and asks for a mod, or he asks for a skin or a texture pack. He saves the thing he was doing and starts another world the next day. But without even knowing it, he's thinking like a programmer. Lots of people think like programmers nowadays because it's intuition. They haven't really figured out what they're doing but they're behaving like programmers. People can spot bugs and glitches in Facebook. People can spot bugs in Snapchat. 
They don't care about the bugs they pick up taking selfies of themselves in public toilets. <laughs> the sort of things that were, were not so prevalent back then are now second nature, as I say. Um, the sort of things that people do in their spare time, they do by nature, are now the beginnings of a career in digital that didn't exist 20 years ago. People like me shouldn't have to start one career and give it up to start another one or give up things like the housework in order to find the time to learn how to do this so they could pursue it for a living. And if, if that was the case, you would think in this world there'd be a lot more millionaires, billionaires at young ages. Um, but if you think about people like Evan Spiegel at Snapchat, uh, Zuckerberg at Facebook, they made it big in their 20s. That guy there is Nick D'Aloisio, who sold an app to Yahoo, age 17. He's a bit of a poster child for it. But they seem to be exceptions in this day and age. If you think about the founders of Google, they were my age. I know they did it a little while ago, but they were my age. But then wind forward a few years, the founders of Uber, the founders of WhatsApp, their multi-billion success stories in the last two, three years, they're my age. So why is it that people a bit younger than me haven't been able to take advantage of it? Why is it that people like me and my age were still coming up with the ideas, or so it seems? It can't be the technology, because anybody is no more than a weekend, a laptop, and a mobile phone, and about $99 from putting an app into the Apple Store. It doesn't take much. It'll be a basic app, and going back to the first example, um, you'll always have time to make it better. But with things like cloud services, open source, advice 24-7 from places like Stack Overflow, you can make a very big app to the scale of WhatsApp in a matter of weeks without really trying. And you can learn the advanced things, unlike me and my bad sewing, which has never improved over the years. James Dyson is similar. I know it's not a digital industry, but he saw something in replacing vacuum cleaners with something he thought would be better. I don't want to invent the technology to do it, but it's all about the vision and having the presence of mind to carry it through. Um, people don't talk about Hoover's so much anymore. People talk about Dyson's. They get divorced over Dyson's. And it's all because that guy had the courage of his convictions to see it through. And this one's a, a good example of mine. That, that the interview for the job I have today at Skyscanner, they asked me for a last question, can you tell us about a product that excited you in the last three months? And my answer was, I've seen a vacuum cleaner that's even better than a Dyson that's going to bust that guy in, in a year. The company went bust in three months. And so not only am I lazy, not only am I a little bit complacent, I'm also a jinx. But complacency is the thing I want to pick up here. So back in my day, um, I ran a pub guide. Um, it had star ratings, it had reviews. But I didn't take it to the next level. TripAdvisor did. Um, I ran a football fanzine that used uh, taxis and takeaways to fund the fanzine a little bit. I didn't take that forward. So Uber and um, Just Eat and companies like that have made billions off ideas that were there 20 years ago. And I find it annoying that, that people do things like that in this day and age, where I was a bit lazy 20 years ago. And I really encourage people to, to do things like that. I'm mentoring some graduates at Skyscanner to make an app for the market as a spare time activity, they're learning and I really hope they make it because there's no reason they shouldn't. You're probably thinking with all this experience, knowledge and the years I've had, why am I not a billionaire and what's my big idea? Well, I've never given up. I run a site that makes terrible jokes from pies. <laughs> We're not supposed to advertise things in these talks, as you know, but if you searched for um, Piderman or Paella, you'll... you'll <laughs> You'll probably find it, so please keep looking. And uh, maybe they'll invite me back next year to tell everybody how I finally made it. <laughs> or maybe they'll invite me back to, to tell people how you can grow old but never actually grow up. <laughs> I just want to leave you with some credits for the people that helped me put this together. Um, I got some real good help on Facebook as I crowdsourced some of this topic. Um, I leave it to your judgment if they deserve thanks or blame. I hope you have a good afternoon. Thank you very much. <laughs>